I think it has gone past two o'clock now. I don't think there's any more activity at the moment. So, uh, so welcome everybody. This is our first um, Friday forum for the, the Peter Maxwell Davis um, Research Network. For those of you who don't know me, I think everybody knows me, but I'm, uh, I'm Nick Jones and uh, with Richard, I'm the co-creator of, of the network. And, um, you know, the, the network's membership continues to, to grow and um, slowly but surely. And, and hopefully, you know, sessions like this um, will really um, encourage people to, um, to deliver papers or informal kind of um, sessions like, like today. Um, but it's an opportunity for, for people to deliver, um, you know, work in progress as well. So, ho so hopefully these will these activities will, will snowball throughout the year. And um, I think the centerpiece for us is the hopefully, fingers crossed, the, the in-person event um, which is being scheduled for, for December at Cardiff University. So that's what we're we're aiming for this year. That, that's the big the big thing. Um, so please do continue to, to spread the word amongst your, your students, amongst your colleagues, and um, just tell them to, to send us an email and, and we can um, add them to the, to the list. So without further ado, then I'm going to pass on to, to Richard, who is uh, chairing this afternoon's session. Thank you, Richard. OK, thanks, Nick. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm sure you're all terribly familiar with this whole Zoom thing now, but uh, I think the best thing is if um, we stay muted and you might want to just kill your cameras as well. Um, but once uh, once uh, Michael has finished, then uh, it, perhaps we could all come back in again. And then um, the, there's no real protocol for asking questions. There are not many of us, but uh, if you want to either use the reaction button with the hand up or you just put your hand up and then we'll know that you want to to ask a question or indeed use the chat function uh, while we're doing it. We can pick those up um, during the course of the of, of the afternoon and then sort of feed them to Michael. Uh, and OK, so so I mean, uh, I'm sure you're aware of Michael, but I'll just uh, give him a little introduction to begin with. Uh, he co-founded Cardiff New Opera Group with Michael Rafferty in 1982 which led to the creation of Music Theatre Wales in 1988. Um, he's had, uh, he has directed a, a, a large number of operas or, or had involvement with some of the standards, but from our point of view, interestingly, uh, Cinderella, which we must have a chat about sometime, Michael, um, um, and The Lighthouse, which of course is um, a fascinating work and, and has had the most, I think the most performances of all Max's um, uh, music theatre pieces. Uh, but uh, it, that's not all, of course, it's not just Max, but he was also the revival director for the Fires of London Company when Max did it. Um, so it, it, he's uh, had numerous awards uh, for the premier production of The Trial by Philip Glass uh, and for Outstanding Achievement in Opera and the TMA Awards. And uh, just to cap it all, he has an MBA in 2016. Michael, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Richard. It's great to be here in Cardiff, uh, where the whole journey began, uh, talking about the relationship between Maxwell Davis. And I'm going to do this in a kind of anecdotal way. And uh, just to give you a sense of what it's like for me as a director working with Max's work. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, Max was the inspiration and, and guiding light of Music Theatre Wales. Um, and I think we created a company uh, because of the impact of his uh, theatrical work. Um, uh, it, it, partly by accident, uh, we grew and grew alongside his work. He became a patron of the company uh, in the early 90s. He was with us for 20 odd years. Um, he was a great friend and a great advocate for the company and invested huge trust in us, I think. Um, and, and over time, I started to understand the historic significance of Max's work. Uh, but initially, of course, as a youngster, as a 21-year-old starting my directing career, um, uh, to begin that with The Lighthouse was an extraordinary thing to do. 
Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how that started. I was in Cardiff studying theatre, having done a music degree in Birmingham. I needed a music director and found this extraordinary uh, musician, violinist, who had um, amazing theatrical instincts under the name of Michael Rafferty. Um, and to, together we started on a mission. What kind of opera were we going to put on? I was determined to put an opera on as part of my coursework at the Sherman Theatre. It needed to be small and we wanted it to be dynamic. And Michael Rafferty was in particular um, very keen on, very committed to contemporary music. Um, I wasn't sure where I wanted to go. Um, and we listened and, to all sorts of things. And together we sat down uh, and Michael Rafferty had actually seen the martyrdom of St. Magnus in the Fires of London production. Um, so he, he was very excited by that. And, and funnily enough, at that time, we didn't talk about the martyrdom. Um, I suspect he thought it was probably a little too complicated to get there at, at that early stage. But we're, in our search, we sat down in the library at Cardiff University Music Department and listened to a cassette tape recording of the BBC broadcast of The Lighthouse. And um, oh, I reckon within 20 minutes or so, we turned to each other and just said, this is it. Um, and it was an instinctive reaction. Um, there was something about the energy and the dynamism of just that listening experience. Uh, this, this, the, 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 there was a theatricality coming across to us through this rather poor recording um, that made sense. And, and somehow or other, I do not know how this happened, we got permission to put on a production of The Lighthouse in 1982 from the publishers, and no doubt Max was behind this as well. And this was only the second ever production of it. There'd been the fires, and then came this Cardiff New Opera Group, two students trying to put something together. I don't know where, where the, what the thinking behind that was, um, other than perhaps wanting to make sure that the lighthouse got out there and got shared more, but trusting it to untried, untested students was quite a brave thing to do. We put together a, a very unusual package, as you would imagine. I had to create a company to raise some money to get some professional stiffening for what was it basically a student enterprise. We had Simon Limbrick, for example, come down from London as percussionist because we couldn't find anybody who could take that part on. We had a semi-pro horn player come over from Bristol. The cast was an amateur tenor who'd made a hell of a name for himself across the music scene in Wales, a fine singer who has in fact just now been given a CBE for his real day-to-day -day work, which is as a, a, a scientist, a, a, a research chemist. Um, there was a part-time singer doing the bass, uh, Kelvin Thomas, who at that point was doing short-term uh, bit parts in the Welsh National Opera Chorus. And there was a student baritone from Welsh College. Um, you know, on paper, it shouldn't have worked, but it did. And it worked, it worked because of the extraordinary nature of that piece, the incredible storytelling, the incredible dynamic and momentum of that music, um, discovering this world by working on this work was incredibly liberating for me as a director, as I was learning about directing, responding to the music, hearing the music come to life, responding to uh, what it was that, 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 that Max might have had in mind and getting a sense right from the beginning that this was a work that was conceived almost in a single moment that the text and the music were one and the same thing. There was no division. There was no, um, there was no sense of setting somebody else's words to music or another kind of thing, trying to force music into something or trying to force a text into a musical world. There was something just pure about it, which, which was most extraordinary. And at the end of doing that production, just three performances in Cardiff, lots of people were saying, this is amazing, you must take it out on tour, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I had no idea what touring was, um, but, but quickly went out to learn, 
because clearly here was a kind of operatic experience that I was instinctively, again, looking for. I loved opera. I loved all that uh, sung drama. I loved the musical world of it. Um, but from a personal point of view, I had always found the world of opera. I'd gone to watch rehearsals at opera houses and things. I'd always found that world strange and different and difficult personally. And yet I loved the drama and I loved the music. And here in the lighthouse was something that made real sense to me. So we did, we decided to form a company. Um, and, and, and that took some time to get going, uh, to raise the money to, to, to do productions. We did several productions, but we didn't become Music Theatre Wales until 1988. Meantime, I had the opportunity to then start working with the Fires of London as a revival director, quite late in the uh, life of the fires. So I only staged, um, I worked as a, an assistant on their original production of The Lighthouse. Uh, and I worked as revival director on a music theatre piece, Le Jongleur de Notre Dame, um, which I think we did in Litchfield with the fires. Um, and then I was asked to restage the martyrdom of St. Magnus in the St. Magnus Cathedral for the festival. Um, after I'd done the lighthouse in Cardiff, I bought a score of the martyrdom. And I'll be honest, on paper, I was not convinced by it. Um, obviously, I was a music reader, a score reader, but I, I, I just felt that there was, seemed to be too much text with not enough sort of going on. Um, and I, I kind of needed convincing and I didn't have the opportunity to actually hear a performance of it, uh, recorded or otherwise. So I wasn't too sure back in 1983, 84. Uh, but when I had the chance to work on the fires, working with people like Neil Mackey, who, who, you know, who knew that score inside out, had done it since its premiere uh, on a production that was already framed, um, I began to sort of understand how, how it worked as musical storytelling um, and how then the, the trajectory really started to make sense because of the musical build. Each scene builds rather brilliantly and the colour and the theatrical um, expression that is written into the score, uh, very cleverly not getting in the way of the text, uh, was a real example, actually, a real lesson in terms of opera writing. But it, it, so it started to fall into place. And of course, when we got the opportunity to get up to Orkney and to hear that piece in that acoustic, in that very, very special church, it was utterly extraordinary. Um, you know, right up to the final moment when the monks walk around the back of the um, audience around the church, uh, encanting the plain chant and... It just just a truly magical experience. You know, my life felt like it had been changed by the lighthouse and it, and it grew further with, with that experience. So when we finally got the chance to create a more or less proper company, Music Theatre Wales, based at an art centre where the administration could be secure, where there was a certain amount of funding available, uh, Michael Rafferty and I, the first thing we decided we wanted to do was a production of The Martyrdom of St. Magnus. Um, and and we, we went for it big time. Um, it was the opening show of the company. Um, and we decided to do an outdoor production using the small Saxon church in the grounds of St. Donat's Art Centre as the backdrop, building a stage into the graveyard, building a seating thing on the scaffolding uh, in the graveyard. And uh, when we actually got to perform it, it was extraordinary. Again, the power of that piece, the atmosphere uh, was extraordinary, was so powerful. Um, but, but what started to really attract me was the content, that was, was what the driving idea behind it of this political prisoner, this pacifist. Uh, taking an individual really, really seriously as a character and uh, creating a situation in which we would reflect on it through our own ex contemporary experience, not view it as a historic one. And of course, he does that brilliantly in the opera with the reporter scene, the updating, 
classic 1960s Maxwell Davis parodies of various kinds of music um, to, to bring us uh, from the medieval to the, uh, to the contemporary, um, which I think in some ways uh, people can very easily misinterpret it as gimmickry. Um, uh, as as uh, showing off in some way, as you know, as end of peer entertainment almost sometimes, um, and I think the same applies to an, to a, to a, to another production that we're very closely associated with, Eight Songs from Mad King. Um, but I think I think there's no gimmickry at all. I think there's deep sincerity in these pieces, um, and so with the martyrdom. Uh, that's where I began to really learn that, uh, began to see how Max as a political thinker with really strong theatrical instincts could convey what he cared about through the medium of chamber opera. And he was kind of inventing a form really on his own. I later came to see that actually Maxwell Davis very, very clearly followed in the footsteps um, of Benjamin Britten. Uh, Benjamin Britten's decision to write The Rape of Lucretia, having done uh, Peter Grimes. Uh, you know, he, he, he chose a very different means of expression, the intimacy uh, of, of, of scale, so that he could share the text and the idea with an audience in a different way to the power and overwhelming nature of grand opera, which Peter Grimes was. Um, and I think Max very clearly followed from that, as did Harry with, with uh, Punch and Judy. So beautiful parallel there. Uh, but Max was clearly working his own way into this. The, 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 from a, from, I think from, again, from that political, from that personal point of view. And in the martyrdom, you can hear uh, how his language, his theatrical language was going. Uh, the gestural thing, uh, certainly, I've talked about you know the, the way that the the, the trumpets herald um, uh, um, characterize the heralds, the way that the horn characterizes an extraordinary outpouring, a declaration, the swooping, weeping, um, hooting horn uh, that he later uses so brilliantly as a character in the lighthouse, the incredible use of percussion and those crotals, they always ring in our ears when we hear the music of Max in in this particular circumstances. But, and as I said earlier, this sense of crescendo, this sense of build um, that goes beautifully with the theatrical dynamic. Each scene is a complete world that takes you from a careful introduction through to something extraordinarily powerful. And yet he has control over the, over the, over the entire structure that works in the same way as well. And it leaves, it leaves the audience not just overwhelmed, there is, a, there is an overwhelming feel to it, um, but, but moved and thoughtful. You know, the hanging of Magnus is, is extraordinarily powerful and terrible, and it should really truly make us think. The, the expressionist language of the, um, of the uh, prison officer, the kind of Nazi prison officer, very post eight songs from Mad King, of course, but done not just to caricature, but to terrify as well. I don't think he's interested in the psychology, but he's interested in what that character represents. So the martyrdom was a huge moment for us. Um, we took it out on tour. We, we did an outdoor production. We took it out on tour. We took it to the Max Fest at the South Bank uh, Center. Uh, playing it in the Festival Hall, and we took it to Glasgow 1990. And both of those were in collaboration with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra. And, and I, to be honest, I felt that was a real step up. That was, uh, that was an amazing experience to have those people who were already so immersed in the world of Maxwell Davis playing this music. But the South Bank experience was quite an interesting one. It was the only time I had a, not a falling out, but a, but a, but a disagreement with Max. Um, and of course I was wrong. Um, so as uh, still quite a young director, um, I decided that the Royal Festival Hall, uh, the atmosphere of that place was not uh, the same as the atmosphere of the St. Magnus Cathedral. Um, and at the end of the opera, I was extremely dubious about traipsing the singers around in their big hobnail boots down the side of the auditorium, chanting this beautiful plain song um, as if, 
we were in a cathedral. So I'd found a, the, the, there's a fantastic spiral staircase at the back of the uh, Queen Elizabeth Hall, um, which is like an echo chamber. So I put the singers down there and had these voices coming back uh, over the backs of the heads of the audience, echoing in the distance. And I got very excited by this. I thought this was the perfect solution. It, 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 it responded beautifully to um, the way that George Mackay write, Brown writes about the sound of the plane chant drifting across the water from the island to the mainland. So I thought this is the perfect solution. And in the dress rehearsal on the afternoon of the performance, Max was sitting alongside me and very happily enjoying it all. We got to the monks moment and he started looking around very anxiously um, and the sound was coming over and, and clearly he was very, very agitated. And he stood up and he shouted, where are the monks? Where are the monks? And he got very upset about this. So I tried to explain as best I could what I was looking for. And he said, that's not, that's not in the piece. The monks must process round. They must be dressed as monks and they must process round. So we had to make four monks habits uh, that afternoon. Uh, someone was dispatched to find old blankets. And that's what we did. And, and of course, it worked fine. It was beautiful. Um, but it was a good example of Max being um, incredibly relaxed about everything, letting, enjoying someone else interpreting his work as a stage production. I wasn't copying the Vires of London production by any means. But when something really, really mattered to him uh, like that, uh, that, 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 that he, he, he made it very, very clear and he absolutely wanted that. And as I say, I was wrong. You know, I'd got a poetic idea about this as a director, but in the end, he wanted those monks in the room because of the impact that they make. You need to feel their presence. And he was dead right about that. Taking that kind of serious theme, um, Eight Songs from Mad King is a production, is a show that uh, Music Theatre Wales has done several times. Um, I mentioned Kelvin Thomas, who joined uh, the very, very first production of The Lighthouse in 1982 as a part-time singer. Well, we recruited Kelvin then to do a production of uh, Eight Songs from Mad King, in fact, in 1986. And the thing that concerned me most about that was, again, the sincerity of the piece. I really wanted to see if we could get past the sort of theatrical histrionics and the expressionist sort of revolutionary nature of the musical world and get to the character in the heart of it. Um, and it's absolutely there in spades. I mean, I, I believe Eight Songs is a really, truly profound work, a work that uh, delves into the distress of the mental disorder of this character um, and does it with humour, does it with pathos, he does it with real drama um, and, and actually the experience of, of, of witnessing eight songs as a performance uh, is of course so different to just simply hearing it. As a student I'd heard it on record and um, you know, to be honest, we thought it was probably a little histrionic and a little funny. Um, but actually, when you experience that in the room and it is taken seriously, then uh, then it then it takes you into another world. And the power, the musical power, uh, as well as the theatrical power that Max extracts from just six instrumentalists is is quite incredible quite incredible, um, quite how he does that, um, I, I'm not sure. Um, it, it, it's so carefully written, actually. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing random about it. Um, the vocal writing, uh, you know, the, obviously there's talk of how he, he, he got to this place, the collaboration with Roy Hart, who was a, 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 a vocal, extreme vocal specialist, uh, uh, extended techniques and all of that but taking that into the world of the fires, the serious contemporary classical music world and all of that, um, it, beca it became something else. Max made it his own. Um, and it, it is without doubt one of those pieces that will live on and on and on, uh, not because of its notoriety, but because of its uh, purity, actually. Um, the other piece that I think will simply go on and on and on is The Lighthouse. 
So Lighthouse happened in 1982. As music theatre Wales, we then decided we had to do it again. Um, we, we, we did it, in fact, several times. Um, it toured in the UK, we took it to Germany, we took it to France. Um, it, it, it did us proud, for sure. Um, and we also, in 1994, we also created um, a, big, a, a filming for BBC Two based on our staging. Um, so we were able to take our staging into studio and film it and adapt it for television. And I worked very closely with the uh, television director on, on, on making that production work. It was an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, and and Max, Max wasn't involved in it at all. He absolutely gave it his blessing. He really loved that production. Um, and he did a wonderful interview. I don't know if it's available these days, but he did a wonderful interview um, about it. And, and uh, there, was a, there was a preview uh, set in the lighthouse uh, uh, itself where, the, where the, um, accident, the tragedy happened. But what is, it, what is it about the lighthouse that makes it so powerful, that makes it so... Um, perfect and, 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 and justifies the fact that it has been, um, it, is being, it is the opera that's performed most um, of, of his canon. Um, when you're working on it, and I think when you hear it, it it's perfectly clear that the, the, the music just burns off the page you get the sense, and you don't just know this because it's true, but you get the sense that this was written in fire, um, that, that, that somehow it's all come out, as I said earlier, as a single entity. Um, he found an absolutely brilliant story. He wrote his own text for it, um, and he structured it uh, in his mind before he wrote a note of music. He's talked about pacing around the island he was living on, um, working out the music and the text together, literally sort of creating a physical map of it as he walked around the island. Um, and I think there's no doubt that you feel that. When, that, when you press go on that show, there's no stopping it. Um, and, and it's interesting how the, the prelude and then the main act work alongside each other. The storytelling nature of the prelude with the three uh, officers reporting to the court of inquiry with the judge represented by the horn, who I think Max originally had sitting in the auditorium. I mean, terrifying experience for a horn player. It's a really, really tricky part. Um, but you hear that. You hear it wherever the horn is. You hear that this, this, there's this character asking these questions and making these demands. Uh, music theatre at its purest, in a way. Um, so, it, 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 and 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 the close harmony of those three officers is immediately engaging and very powerful and and conflicting. You, you, it's harmony, but you get a sense that not all three guys really necessarily agree, and that is explored beautifully. And then there are these switch fl uh, flashbacks to the uh, to the scenes on on the lighthouse and in the boat. Um, and then the main act itself. And again, it would be quite easy to fall into the trap of doing this as a wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, a kind of gimmicky story, uh, a great tale to tell and a really fun opera to do uh, with a violent um, and mysterious end. But there, of course, is so much more to it than that. And the, and the most extraordinary example of the way that Max thought about this as music drama are those brilliant, simple songs that each of the characters sings to each other. Come on, Blazes, give it a break. Give us a song, you know, uh, just, just let's break the tension in this room. And of course, each song not only characterizes the nature of those, those individuals, the Bible bashing Blazes, the rough and tumble Glaswegian, uh, uh, Blazes, sorry, of, um, um, I've forgotten his name now. Anyway, you know, the bass. Um, there's, the, there's the Glaswegian Blazes and there's the Arthur, Arthur the bass, um, and, and the brilliant tenor song, the parlor song. But the way that those songs reveal the character's past and the way that that past is already written into the piece itself and the way that those songs allow 
that uh, subtext through the music out through the story, through the character into this huge explosion of fear and paranoia and guilt um, and, uh, and, and the abrasion of character on character and how they project this then onto something else, the beast, the beast that's in them all, frankly, but how they, how they, how they project that into something else. The beast, is it the, is it the arriving ship or whatever? Max again in the music conceiving not just the automatic lighthouse, the flashing of the light, but also the flashing of the lights on the boat as it's being appro as it's approaching the lighthouse. Everything, everything is brought into that score um, in, 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 in an even more sophisticated and even purer way than it is in the martyrdom. It's like all of that, all of that skill that he learned writing the martyrdom uh, really comes to a peak in the lighthouse. Um, quite amazing. So working on a piece like that as a director, and this is one of the things that I learned very, very early on. In fact, the very first production, 1982, was the experience of saying that everything you need to know as this stage director is there in the music already. It's absolutely there. You've got to not just trust it. You've got to find a way to hear it and let it speak um, like unlocking in some ways the mind of the composer as he sat there and wrote this music. Um, to, 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 and and then, then you're told what to do. It, it's, it's amazing what that, those scores have. Um, and and that if you put trust in them, they will repay you uh, enormously. Um, and I know, I, you know that's why Max actually enjoyed our production so much. When he came to... Uh, do pre-performance talks, which he did quite a few on the final tour of the lighthouse that we did. And I can't remember when that was now, uh, mid nineties. Um, he, he, he was one particular memory I have with going to Huddersfield festival. And uh, we met up, you know, an hour before uh, to do the pre-performance talk. And he said, give me two minutes. I need to rush into the theater and just sit there and look at the set for a moment. Uh, I, I, and, and I, I love that will that will take me into the world of the lighthouse, which is an incredible compliment to have, you know, especially for our designer, uh, given that simply that reflects the piece that he wrote. Um, but it, it it it's that sense of uh, yeah, it was that sense of character that is built into into the music, uh, into into the way that he tells the story, the. Um, the, the precision of that scoring, despite the fact that you feel it's written in incredible speed, but there's such precision there. The instrumental gesture, the percussion gesture. Yes, there's an amazing power and there's nothing quite like sitting in a small auditorium, hearing a score like the, like, like, uh, the lighthouse being played. Um, uh, you know, it, that's, that's as good as Wagner anytime for me, frankly. Um, but but there's um yeah, I will use the word again. There's a purity to his storytelling. So we finished with uh, we finished doing Maxwell Davis's work. Um, there was always a danger that we would become the fires mark two. Um, and there's one part of the story actually I want to share with you, um, which I hadn't. So when we formed Music Theatre Wales in 1988 was shortly after the fires of London were being closed down by Max. And Max very generously said that we could have any of the sets, props, costumes, and theatrical touring equipment, music stands, music stand lights, all that. He gifted that to Music Theatre Wales, which was incredible. And then on top of that, he sold us all of the fires of London percussion equipment, which was quite an extensive stock of decent equipment for a very small price. We paid £5,000 for absolutely everything. Um, in over the last couple of years, uh, maybe three or four years, we've actually decided to sell all of our entire stock as Music Theatre Wales. We built it up a bit and moved things on. And people were so excited to be buying some of the old 
Fires of London percussion equipment. I had a music teacher come down from the north of England and he was so pleased when he picked up this broken rickety marimba in a Fires of London flight case with a sticker on it. He was so excited. And in the end, we broke even. We sold it all for £5,000, which is just remarkable. So as and, and to carry that tradition on, now we've decided to, as Music Theatre Wales, close our touring store down. We have donated all of our touring equipment, which is essential for touring as an opera company, to Snape Malting so that they can carry on that tradition. So it's incredible how the world goes round and round and round. But that, that's, what's, that's what's happening. So that's a really nice thing to do. So Max, Max was important to the start of the company right through. Right towards the very end of Max's life, uh, Michael and I went to see him in London. And I'd written to him in advance and said, could we talk? Um, and we had what looked like an opportunity to work with the festival uh, 1418, which was um, a festival of art celebrating 100 years since the First World War. Um, and I just had a hunch that actually, if he was interested, Max would be really taken and would have something to offer to that festival. Another chamber opera uh, exploring the impact of that war, because we know what he thought about war. We know what his experiences of war were as a, as a young man, uh, a child. Um, and you know, through the martyrdom, we know about his, his, his expression of, of hatred for war and for fighting and that sort of thing. So, um, and he was, we met with him and he, he'd been thinking, uh, could he come up with a subject that would be suitable for that festival, uh, that would make a statement, if you like. Um, but sadly, at that time, he was going through, you know, really serious, heavy treatment uh, for his cancer. Um, and he declined. He, he was sorely tempted, but he declined to take that opportunity any further. So, you know, in some ways, it's the one that got away. Um, I think he, he absolutely made the right decision for himself personally. He, did, he, if he If he'd done it, it would have taken everything out of him. Um, and that would have been a terrible thing to do, um, you know, and he put all of that energy into writing that final symphony and everything like that. So, so you know, that, that, that was more important in a way. But it would have been fascinating for us to imagine what kind of an opera he would have written to reflect on uh, the horrors of the 1418 war. So that was the one that got away. Um, but we had a beautiful conversation um, and it wasn't just um, it wasn't just dismissed by any means. He, he engaged in a few ideas around what we might do. But in the end, it didn't happen. So from, you know, that's an anecdotal journey of my of my relationship with act with Max outside outside of music theatre Wales. I did do uh, Cinderella for um Welsh National Opera, the children's opera, uh, which again, Max came down to see and, and loved. And in fact, I think he was tickled pink when we um, asked for translation, uh, asked for um, permission to translate it into Welsh. So we did it at Cricketh Festival in North Wales in Welsh, and then on um, Welsh language television, S4C, S for, uh, for Christmas. We did it on a Boxing Day broadcast of uh, Max's Cinderella with young people singing in Welsh. And, uh, that was, an, that was an extraordinary thing to do. Um, of course, coming out of his, his amazing community and young people's work in, uh, in Orkney. So all I can say is, um, thank you, Max. Uh, he completely and utterly changed my life by giving me the work that um, I discovered was right for me um, as a director and which inspired the creation of Music Theatre Wales, um, which I think has, has made a significant contribution to the development of opera um, and the engagement of opera audiences across the UK over the last 35 years. So thank you, Max.
Michael, thank you ever so much. I was just finding all my mute buttons and all the other things. Um, the fascinating story, particularly of, of the, the lighthouse. I mean, I, I grew up um, with the, the martyrdom and, and the lighthouse. Um, and and since I've written about it, I mean, just just for for people who are, who are perhaps not as familiar with it, there's there's quite a number of of stories attached to it. One of the ones was that um, the lighthouse at Flannan failed on the for the first time on the night of the first performance. Uh, Max used to used to quote that one because he would see it as somehow somehow having. <laughs> A, a kind of significance, a spiritual significance. Uh, but it also, there's a, you, you mentioned Cinderella, and I said to you that um, I, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about that sometime. He, um, he actually said that he was writing Cinderella and The Lighthouse at the same time. Actually, I think it, the timing doesn't quite work, but he, he said, I, didn't, I don't think I showed any more than the usual signs of schizophrenia, writing the two things simultaneously. Um, but but it was also it was also a fascinating aspect of it that he, he talked also about um, well also to John Amos he was he he wrote that he was having a compositional crisis when he must have been writing the lighthouse um, so he said I can't write he said to John Amos in summer I can't can't I just can't write so so I'm not sure how how the actual dynamic of that all worked with relation to the lighthouse. But then, he, then he, he said also really interesting comments. He says the forces generated during the composition of the lighthouse and resurrection, he says this afterwards, of course, were such that I felt that they had to be spiked. So he introduced specific wrong notes into it. <laughs> so, but it's full of symbolism, you know, I mean, I, I, and I've, I wrote about that in the book that we wrote. Um, so this is, there's a huge amount of, of, um, of stuff behind it. By the way, did you also know that he wrote to Gerald McBurney saying that the characters, Arthur, Sandy and Blazes, represented air, earth, fire, surrounded by water. So there's, again, you know, so the whole thing about Max's symbolism. Anyway, enough, enough from me. Thank you ever so much, Michael. And uh, perhaps if, if everybody could sort of pull themselves back in now and um, put their videos on, and then uh, we'll take questions. I'm sure, Michael, you'd be happy to take anything that people want to say. I'll just give you one more anecdote, actually, just picking up on resurrection. I remember when I was rehearsing the martyrdom with the fires in London, Max proudly walked into the room and slammed this huge pile of paper onto a table and said, I finished. And that was the score of resurrection. Yeah. <laughs> it's remarkable. We didn't have time to look at it. <laughs> okay. I'll just put myself for everybody on gallery view so I can see. Um, okay, do we have any questions for Michael? Nick, <laughs> don't forget you're muted. Yeah, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> um, Michael, thank you so much. That was really, really fascinating. And, um, you know, all the stuff about the, the lighthouse, the eight songs from Mad King, it takes me back to when I was a student in Cardiff. Um, and I went along as a master's student to the performance that you gave of the lighthouse in 1994 at the Reard and Smith um, theater at the museum. And Max get, uh, delivered his pre um, performance talk. It was the first piece I'd heard live of Max. It's the first time I'd heard him speak. And uh, the rest is history, as they say, because that that performance completely knocked me out. And um, it's funny at the time we were looking at the Antichrist. Um, hmm. There were only two of us in the <laughs> in in the class, and it was Stephen Walsh. So, so um, we we were treated to to Walsh's to, to Stephen's um, analysis of the piece, and and uh, a week later we were thrown into the lighthouse. And uh, yeah, it was so. So there's a lot of nostalgia there for me. And and Kelvin Thomas actually was my keyboard harmony teacher, <laughs> of of all things. And uh, Mike Rafferty I knew because he he also conducted the the PM ensemble, um, Peter Reynolds ensemble. So yeah, lot lots of really good things there. Thank you so much. I didn't know about the festival fourteen. Um, 18. Um, so that's that's really good to know. My question. I'm coming to my question now. <laughs> My question um, revolves around what you were saying about musical storytelling and Max being a master at that. And I've just finished looking at um, the Doctor of Mudfai and the way that 
the the the, the story kind of unravels and and unfolds rather um um you know over a period of an, an hour and a half or so i mean both of the, the the pieces that you've been talking about today are an hour and 15 now i'm just to quote you you say about the martyrdom the scenes build um perfect example of opera writing now that of course is i mean max wrote his own libretto but based on uh, George Mackay Brown's novel Magnus. Now, The Lighthouse, of course, is another um, libretto written by Max. How you, you didn't necessarily talk about um, or specifically talk about the way that the, the story unravel or unfolds there as well. Do you think that it's equally as successful as the martyrdom, um, the way that Max unfolds the musical narrative and, and the story behind that? Do you think this is a, it's effective or, or be, how is it so successful? Is the success just a matter of the, the impact that it makes musically? No, I, th I, th I think it's an, a considerable step forward from the martyrdom. I think he learned his craft writing the martyrdom in terms of chamber opera. So I think the lighthouse is actually a much more sophisticated piece of storytelling. Um, and, and as, as, as musical storytelling. So in the martyrdom, you do have those early scenes. There is quite a bit of waiting around. You know, they, they spend a lot of time talking about and telling the story of, whereas in the lighthouse, they, they both narrate, but they narrate in a way that's part of the drama, you know, and that's the cleverness of the, of the court scene where they can give narrative, but they give narrative in the present as character. So it's, it's incredibly clever. Um, and and, and the, the musical integration, uh, the way that the, the, the ensemble uh, plays a much more dynamic role continuously in the lighthouse than it does in the martyrdom, I think is really significant. And yet he can still get the voices forward. He can still get the text heard. And I think he was very concerned about that as Britain was, you know, and, and I think, you know, it takes a bit of learning to do that as, as a composer. And the, the, the combination of those three voices that I talked about, the, the officers singing in close harmony at the beginning, is absolutely extraordinary because the rhythm of it um, enables the text to cut through. I think that, you know, that's a remarkable piece of writing. Um, and he understood how that English text could, could work and, 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 the words have a rhythm in them and a bounce in them. And I think that, uh, yeah, so it's actually much more sophisticated. And, and, and I think the success is, is much more than, yes, it has an amazing impact, but that's like stage one. And there are another nine to go in terms of why that piece works. Um, the, you know, the, the way he sets up the, the main act on the lighthouse through the prelude is, is, is a really clever piece of theatrical writing. Mm. You know, he entices us. He wants, he wants, like a good murder mystery, you set up the scene and you want to know what went on. And then he starts to unpack what went on, his own hypothesis about that. Um, and, and, you know, he, he uses, if you like, every trick in the book as a storyteller to hook you um, and he doesn't let you off that hook at all. And, and, and the light relief of the songs is in fact, you know, the, the, the punch in the guts, isn't it? Because it, 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 he uses that lightness to, to turn it into its uh, denouement. So it, it, it's actually one of the most sophisticated pieces uh, and most integrated pieces of music theatre that I know. Uh, just to, to comment a little on that, there was also the tarot connections and he was using numbers and there's, there's some really interesting, you talked about the bit where they, they, they tell the story, but they're all telling slightly different versions of the story. And Max underscores that by things like using um, whole tone scale for one of the thing and using 13 as a generating number, 13, you know, becomes a, just for a short time. So. Uh, underneath all that is the, the, the text, he's actually working the musical material to, to emphasise the meaning. But you don't know that until you start digging under, mm. under the surface of the music. Yeah, and, you know, there's always a question about how much does the audience understand that? And I think the audience doesn't understand it, but you feel it. 
it, there's something in it that that communicates because because again it's not it's not it's not gimmickry it's tools that max is using to uh, communicate what he wants to communicate and and that difference of the you know telling the same story through different eyes uh, or different memories or different sets of denials uh, which those characters do it, it you know needs some distinction and yet they're subtle distinctions and of course you know you've mentioned the tarot that comes to the fore in a very major way in the lighthouse with the voice of the cards as the guys are playing crib you know there's this there's this alternative reality going being played out uh with the voice of the cards and that's the one moment you think oh hang on has he taken this too far has it gone has it gone out of our world of the lighthouse that world of reality that he sets up but actually of course it just leads towards the very end anyway it leads towards the idea of the beast um and the sense of 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 you know is it just an innocent game the the uh crib or is is there something else at a uh, play which those two other characters know nothing about yeah. is there any other questions uh, so that we don't do all the questioning there's so many other things we could say ask yeah I hi Karen. hi, hi. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about this idea of gimmickry, because when I think of the pieces that I try, when I try to introduce new people to Max's work, they tend to latch on to those gimmicks. And I'm wondering what kind, how do you stage these works to sort of sidestep the charge of gimmickry, especially if Max is so particular about what he wants people to see on stage? So if you take eight songs, for example, you know, I talked about the hysteric side of it, the, the histrionic. Um, and, and if you like, you know, you could take a kind of um, Victorian approach, you know, visiting um, madhouses, finding people entertaining who are off the rails and going crazy. You know, I mean, that's, that's not a contemporary view by any means. And I don't think it was Max's view at all. Um, and he... I, I'm absolutely sure he right, he's exploring distress much more than he's exploring madness, you know? So this, this, this a mind that is torn to shreds and yet knows it's torn to shreds is, is what I think is going on. So the histrionics come out of a very real, raw, emotional place and, and a, a genuinely psychological place. And if you approach it with that serious intent, the piece gives gives you everything. Um, it, it's absolutely all there. But as you know, it, it's an operatic failing uh, to play it for for laughs. Uh, to 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 demonstrate how crazy the writing is is absolutely not the point. Thanks, Michael. And somebody else. Any questions? I mean, it's interesting, My, Michael. It's interesting that um, Max of the, the group you mentioned, Tyrus and Burt Whistles, Punch and Judy, but actually Max was the only one who kept with the idea of music theatre throughout, even to the children's works. The children's works were all called music theatre. Um, although, you know, obviously there's the opera because Resurrection. I mean, he actually says at one point that He's got when quite young. When he was quite young, he was going to write three operas. Well, actually, he ended up. I don't suppose he he, he envisaged Komolatonin, but then he didn't envisage what was going to happen financially to him either. I'm sure. But 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 that's fascinating because betrayal was so much part of what he was, what his things are about. Betrayal of the mind, betrayal of the individual, to be betrayed in the way that he was actually must have been uh, very profound. He was he was he was so so angry by that. I've never seen him so angry. Um, uh, it was incredible, really. And you know what he went through over those last years, from the betrayal of the Arnolds, um, and then the whole business um, later on in life um, with his partner. Uh, you know that 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 really tore him apart, and he was feeling quite battered by all of that. But you're right, the betrayal was was a really deep felt thing. On the three operas front, of course, I mean, my first encounter with Max was actually um, 
uh, Taverner at Covent Garden, um, which must have been around about 1980, 81, something like that. I think they revived it. Um, and I watched some rehearsals of that at the garden, which was, you know, absolutely fascinating. A, br a brilliant Ralph Coltai set of the weighing scales um, in a Michael Jelliot production. Quite, I mean, extraordinary, brilliant idea. Um, but then he left that he left that scale alone, and I, yeah, it's interesting that he stuck with this music theatre idea. And I think it was the immediacy of communication that really attracted him. I, I really do. I think he he liked sharing this work with audiences rather than rather than um, wanting the big stage to dominate and tell people how to feel. He wanted to share the work. I think it's interesting too that you mentioned the that the when you first looked at the libretti, that how you thought it was all words because that was the big criticism of Max Libretti's that they all were words. I mean, uh, Keller was, was on when when his Tavener said. Why are they talk? Why do they talk to each other so much? And you know, why is it? So it's it's an interesting. I mean, it's interesting. That your reaction, like his, was about was about that. Whereas you know, I mean, you went you've gone you went past that and looked at the drama behind it, which I think maybe he missed. Uh, other questions? Yeah, just, just picking that up, Richard, on the and going to the drama behind the text, but also really understanding. Uh, how the music was making that text more than what it was on its own. You know, how, how, how the musical description and how the musical animation uh, alongside the text in the martyrdom in particular um, uh, b b brings, brings um, is actually what Max was really interested in. You know, the text on its own what is not sufficient. And, and it should never be sufficient for an opera, you know. It's it's the framework. It's the skeleton. It needs flesh needs to be put on the bones, and 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 the organs need to be inserted. And that's what Max does as an opera composer quite brilliantly, uh, you know. And it's not all it's not all composers who can write text by any means, and it's not the only way to do it. But but he found a way to make it work. Hi, right. Alex. A really trivial thing, <laughs> um, but I was just thinking as we were talking, has anyone seen that film, The Lighthouse, that came out the other year? I just wonder if there's any, have you, did you, did you see any interesting parallels there? Because it's a very strange and interesting film as well. <laughs> um, I yeah. kicked myself for not seeing it. <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> but, a bit, but I'm sure, I'm sure there are parallels. I mean, when I was reading about it, it sounded all too familiar. I mean, it has a very, the music I wouldn't say is, you know, Peter Maxwell Davis like in any way, but it's got a very striking electronic score as well. That's quite right. kind of elemental, actually. So, yeah, there's sort of similar, something similar sonically, I think. Well, it, I mean, it's it's such an extraordinarily good idea, isn't it? To have three, three um, conflicting characters stuck in one place for too long. You know, mm. that's a great place to start a story, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if, if you're interested in what goes on in between those characters um, and what impacts on them. Uh, and so a lighthouse is a very, very particular example, <laughs> a very extreme example of that. But, uh, uh, you know, and he, Max's genius was finding that story, yes, but converting it into something bigger than the original. Yeah. Michael, do you have a view on whether the officers uh, killed the uh, lighthouse keepers or not at the end. Because Max leaves it open, you know, was it, is, is it something beyond that happens or they all go mad and, and disappear off and, you know, marry Celeste like, or? I, I, it, it is deliberately open and it should remain thus. Um, it always feels to me when I'm working on the piece that the uh, officers from the relief ship have a lot more to say than they ever dare to say. Um, that there is much greater trauma for them. Now, whether that trauma is that they confronted these guys and couldn't handle it and sorted it out, or whether they were attacked, or whether just the sheer trauma of finding the place in the state that it was in 
because of that wonderful conflict about the chair was turned over. No, it wasn't. There was this turned over. There was a leg missing. There was a Wellington boot, whatever. You know, that all that stuff um, reveals that there are great cracks in the story um, that they're telling. So I, I like to think of the, the officers as being traumatized, but not knowing quite exactly why. Um, and the beautiful idea of bringing the ghost of the um, lighthouse keepers back under the automatic light is, is absolute genius. I think that's really, really clever because it allows you to believe that the story lives on in these stones. Um, you know, and that, that, that's, that's, that's amazing. I think that, again, you know, we talked about the symbols and um, uh, the tarot and the numbers and all of this. Uh, but at, at heart, these are all, and I think this is what I mean really in response to Karen's question. These are all, uh, they, these all reveal the humanity of Max. You know, his, his real sense of people. Anybody any questions before I hand back to Nick? Hey, Nick, over to you. Okay, Th thank you, Richard. And thank you once again, Michael. Re honestly, that was a really fascinating talk for, yes, we need a clap, I think. <laughs> Virtual, um, it's a shame we can't be together, but I suspect that Karen wouldn't be able to join us <laughs> who is Zooming in from, from, from the States. And um, that's one of the great things about this network. I mean, we've got people in the States, we've got people in Australia, all around um, Europe. Yo is, is based in Germany. So lovely to, to see him here today as well. So um, I suppose that that's the good thing that that's come out of this, this, this dreadful, awful pandemic. But uh, thank you again. It's been a great start to our Friday Forum series. And uh, the next one is in six weeks time. I can't remember what, what date it is, but I think it's the, the first Friday in, in July. Um, so I'll be sending out details about that uh, to everyone then. But um, in the meantime, as they say, stay safe and, and well, everybody. And uh, thank you ever so much for, for coming today. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Michael. Thank Hello, you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>